Good morning. Welcome to Grace Church of Harmony. We are glad that you are here today. And those of you who are watching online somewhere, we're glad you are with us. You'll notice in your uh, bulletin, there's a green insert. We've got this, con this con uh, conference, concert coming up with David Phelps. It's coming up really very quickly. And we need people to help pull off this event. And if you look at the other side of this, we need people doing, working some of the merchandise table. We'll call ticket table. We're going to have people to lug stuff around. And it's the ways that we need people to help. And if you would be interested in helping in any of these ways, you can uh, contact Beth Wallace here or contact the church office. Uh, so, you know, it's a good opportunity for service. Okay, just a reminder, now we're getting closer here. Uh, baptism on Sunday, August 28th at 9.30, downstairs during the, the Sunday school hour. It's always exciting. We have a number of people signed up to be baptism. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ but never been baptized, you ought to. Uh, so please uh, pray about this. Or if you want to talk about it, give us a holler, and we'll be happy to talk about it with you. All right, the other announcements in the bulletin. There's good, some good stuff you should look at on your own, but Denny Ald has an announcement. Good morning. I get a better res Thank you. I get a better response in the first service, and they were half asleep. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, that's what we're talking about. Okay, listen, this is a question for all women right now. How many of you women out there have, do or have made breakfast for your husband? Show of hands. Make breakfast. God bless you women. I am impressed. I don't know as if Leslie's ever made breakfast for me. I mean, not to, I asked her if I could say that, but, you know, I don't want to get in. Okay, how many of you guys make your own, no, wait a minute, make your own breakfast? That could be coffee. Cereal, toast. Okay, not bad, not bad. Well, both of you, men and women, are in luck. Because next Saturday, you women don't have to get up and make breakfast. You guys don't have to get, make breakfast. 8.30, we're having a men's breakfast downstairs. We're having, a, from Family Life, a guy that's going to come and speak about marriages. Now, great, no, wait a minute, you older guys, which I am one. Don't say you old dogs can't teach, you know, learn new tricks. You can He's going to talk about a marriage as a covenant between God and a woman and man. So it's, it's all three together. It's, it's just not man and woman or anything like that. So please, please come. Uh, your wives will be happy when you go back home and learn something, and, and they'll see a difference in you or something. For your older men, like myself and I, you, we have grandchildren, granddaughters, grandkids that, that we can share with and, and talk to and, and stuff like that. So please, please come. Uh, you can sign up in the portico over here, excuse me, <coughs> the portico over here, it's a $10 uh, to help defer expenses. If you don't have the money, John Casker said that he would be more than happy to pay for anyone. And I, I just wanted to see if John would fall off the pew, but he didn't. So yeah, I would be more than happy to pay for anyone. So please, please come out. <laughs> what do you say, what'd you say, John? So anyhow, yeah, for men, 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 please come out. Uh, you absolutely love it. It'll be a good breakfast and everything else. So looking forward to seeing you. Thank you. Good morning. As we prepare this morning to enter into worship of the triune God, I invite you to stand and sing with us to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come thou, almighty King. <laughs> Come now, Almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days, come thou incarnate word, girl. Spirit of God. 
Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, it's only by Your grace that Your people of faith offer You true service. Father, grant us that we can run the race without stumbling, and we will receive all your heavenly promises. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. I answer them in the order in which they arrived. So we're going to tackle another one this week. It's probably been a few weeks since I received this. So if, if you're waiting and have it, I'll get to it. I promise you. It's very interesting. I mean, it's, it's cool having all these questions come in. Now, today we want to talk about this, the Nicene Creed. When we say the Nicene Creed, some of, if some of you grew up saying the Nicene Creed, and you maybe recognized it right away, others of you perhaps not. But there's a line in the Nicene Creed that we leave out. And here's the line that we leave out every time we say it. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And the reason we leave it out is because some members of the church leadership were feeling that there's something about that that might be easily misunderstood or, or could cause confusion. So it's good. Somebody asked me a question about the Nicene Creed, so we can address it this morning. Uh, so let's try to clear up a little bit of the confusion. Now, first of all, you may, we may want to answer the question, well, where does, this line, where does this idea come from, baptism for the remission of sins? Well, it comes right out of Acts chapter 2 from the New Testament. You know, on the day of Pentecost, Peter was preaching and, and saying to the Jewish people, that he says, you know, you nailed Jesus. The nation nailed Jesus to the cross. And it, it cut them to the heart, and they were saying, well, what do we got to do to be saved? And Peter said, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, or for the remission of your sins. So, now here's the question. The big, the big question is, so why does the Nicene Creed say, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins or for the forgiveness of sins. Well, you need to know a little something about church history. In the early 300s, the church was severely persecuted all around the Roman Empire. I mean, it was a really bad time, and some Christians denied their Christian faith. And some pastors surrendered their scriptures to the Roman authorities. Now, nowadays, you know, we have a printing press, and everyone's got three Bibles in their home. Back then, you know, in the 300s, every copy of the Scriptures was copied by hand. And there weren't, there weren't three Bibles in every home. A lot of people only, sometimes the bishop or the local pastors had the Scriptures. So when the Roman authorities said, you know, give us your Bible, you know, for those pastors who turned over their Scriptures to the authorities, they were viewed as traitors, as people who were like going over to the enemy. And so then the question came up, you know, uh, after the persecution ended is, well, what do you do with the people who denied the faith? Or what do you do with these pastors that gave away our precious scriptures? And there were some Christians who later on came to be called Donatists. They said, if you surrender the scriptures or if you renounce Christ, then you are no longer a Christian and you need to, and your first baptism doesn't count. It just doesn't even count anymore. It's like you need to be saved all over again. You need to repent again, and you need to be baptized again. And moreover, if anybody received baptism from one of these pastors who surrendered the scriptures to the authorities, then that baptism never counted in the first place. 
And so in other words, they said, you have to be rebaptized by a pure pastor, a good guy that never messed up. Well, this led to a raging debate that, that divided northern Africa, and it went back and forth, back and forth. And finally, in 381 A.D., uh, the, the, the church leaders from around the world, they got together, and the phrase, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins was added to the Nicene Creed. In short, the bishops, the pastors, they decided that based on the Scriptures, baptism is a one-time deal. You're, you're baptized in the name of Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And even if you do something bad, okay, you turn to the Lord in faith, but you don't have to be rebaptized. And if the person who baptizes you has done something bad, that doesn't mean your baptism is invalid, as long as it was done in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that's what that phrase is all about in the Nicene Creed. There's one baptism for the remission of sin. One baptism, that's enough. You don't have to keep on being rebaptized every time you lapse. All right, let's pray together. Father, sometimes we are overwhelmed by our sin. We feel condemned, lost. We're in the darkness. We're in mourning. And when we look at your holiness... We are driven to your throne, and before the throne, we remember him who died in our place. And in our mind's eye, we see a man dying on a skull-shaped hill, spread eagle on crossbeams by the town garbage heap between two thieves. And Father, we're glad, and we rejoice in your grace, and we understand the cost. And Father, you know all of us. You know what frightens us. You know our, our deep need to be liked by other people. You know our sleepless nights. You know our, the mind that gropes for answers, wondering if you will sustain us. And Father, you know all the family problems we're going through, the financial problems. So we're here as a child would come to a daddy who loves us. And we pray in Jesus.
Don't drop a single anchor, we're almost home. Through every toil and danger, we're almost home. How many pilgrim saints have before us gone? No stopping now, we're almost home. The promised land is calling, we're almost home. And not a tear shall fall, then we're almost home. Make ready now your souls for that kingdom come. No turning back, we're almost home. Almost home, we're almost home. So press on toward the blessed shore. Oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. This journey ours together, we're almost home. Unto that great forever, we're almost home. What song anew we'll sing round that happy throne. Come faint of heart, we're almost home. Almost home, we're almost home. So press on toward the blessed shore. Oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. Life is just a vapor, we're almost home. That sun is setting yonder, we're almost home. Take courage, for this darkness shall break to dawn. Oh, lift your eyes, we're almost home. on toward that blessed shore. Oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. Almost home, we're almost home. So press on toward that blessed shore. Oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. Our scripture reading is found in Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 5 through verse 22. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. 
This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth, destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten, and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word. Please stand once again and sing with us before the throne of God above. My life 
This morning, Pastor Pete will be preaching from Hebrews once again, and so we are reading here from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Once again, please stand and sing with us. Bye. 
children, you are dismissed to Children's Church. The rest of you may be seated. written to a group of people called the Hebrews. And, and this letter is being sent to the small congregation of Jewish Christians who are baptized into the Christian faith and have since then been going through various forms of persecution. And it has been very difficult for them. And some of these church attenders are starting to ask if it's really worth it. And they're, they're asking them, I mean, if Jesus is the Messiah, why is he letting us suffer like this? And why hasn't Jesus come back and set up his kingdom and vanquished all his enemies? I mean, this is getting ridiculous what we're going through. Now, in chapter 11, the author, he brings up a whole bunch of Old Testament examples to show them that, that for the believer, life has always been like this, even going way back to the beginning of the Old Testament. You have faith in God's promises, and you find yourself in the minority at times, and, and there are storms in life, there are challenges, there are difficulties, but you keep on believing. He's saying that's the way it has always been. And for the people receiving this letter, for them to abandon Christ and, and, and go somewhere else for comfort is, is a horrible mistake. People in the Bible have always trusted God through hard times and persecution and through storms. So what pleases God is a life of faith. Now today's example we're going to take a look at is Noah. And Noah lived in a terrible time. If you listen to what we read earlier in Genesis chapter 6, I mean, people were, they were forgetting about God. They were cruel. They were violent. They, they were disobeying God, and they, they came up with ways of doing evil more and more all the time. Everybody was plotting something that was wrong. And God's gut response that we read is God said that he regretted that he had made humanity and it grieved him to the heart. So God said, I'm going to send a big judgment. I'm going to send a, send a flood, and I'm going to wipe out animal life. I'm going to wipe out people. And I'm going to start over again. I mean, I mean it's, it's a terrible judgment, but it's come to this and I have to do it. And when we read that, we think, well, that's the end of humanity. I mean, it's all over. But no, because what we saw in Genesis 6 was this line, but Noah found favor. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God is going to save. He's going to rescue humanity by delivering Noah and his family. He's going to keep humanity alive so that one day a descendant of Noah named Jesus will provide eternal salvation once and for all, for all who have faith in him. So let's take a look at the example of Noah's faith in the midst of a very wicked world. So we'll go ahead, if you'd like to, and open your Bibles to Hebrews 11, chapter 7. Just looking at one verse, but there's a lot of meaty things in here. And you'll notice verse 7 begins with those two words that the author repeats over and over again, by faith. Faith has to have something to believe in, right? You have to, if there's going to be faith, you have to have an object of your faith. And for Noah, it was a divine revelation, a specific warning he received directly from God. And it says in, in our text this morning, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. Okay, so we have to ask, well, what event is it he's talking about that is unseen? Well, that the world's animal and human populations were going to be destroyed in an enormous catastrophic flood. That was unseen. Uh, the flip side of that judgment program, which was another unseen event, was that God would rescue Noah, his wife, his three sons, and his three daughters-in-law, and, and this huge 
it's like a big floating box. That's what an ark really was uh, that Noah and his family were going to build. And God gave Noah very specific instructions. And now, again, the word ark means something like wooden chest box. I mean, the, the, the shape of the ark was probably like a great big enormous shoe box. And it was to be one and a half football fields long and 75 feet wide and about 45 feet, about four stories high. In fact, you can go out to Kentucky and see an exact life-size replica of the ark. Now, think of Noah's faith in all of this. He'd never seen a flood. Not that we know. Maybe there was some little local overflow, but he'd never seen any kind of flood like it was going to happen. He had never seen a boat as big as the ark that he was going to build. But here's the thing. He believed God. And because he believed him, he built it. He believed God's promise that God would save Noah and his family. And biblical faith is believing what God has said and then entrusting oneself to God. Supposing you're a person that handles uh, uh, retirement investments, and I believe that you're honest. I believe that you're a good investor, and so I, I hand you my money to invest. See, I am entrusting myself to you. Or uh, if a father is playing with his daughter and she's on the, the, the top bunk and dad says, jump off the top bunk and I will catch you. And the child believes that her dad will catch her. But when she jumps, that's when she's really entrusting herself to him. That's what the Bible calls faith. Now, how do we know that Noah entrusted himself to God. Well, and what's the evidence for that? Well, it says here, because in reverent fear, Noah constructed an ark for the saving of his household. See, Noah and his family spent 120 years building that big floating shoebox. And you can be pretty sure that for over a century, they were probably ridiculed at times, laughed at, mocked, probably ostracized by some of their extended family. And you can see someone coming by and saying, hey, Noah, when is the flood coming? Noah, what's a flood? You know I mean, Noah was talking about this big event that nobody had ever seen before. It could seem very ridiculous. But you see, uh, Noah has faith in the unseen. He believes what God has told him, even though there was not one scrap of evidence at that point that a flood was coming, except for the Word of God. Now, God is saying to them and God is saying to us, when the going gets tough, remember God's promises. Think about what God has said and keep on entrusting yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is your older brother your high priest. He is your advocate. He is your grace giver. Now, I want you to note the phrase, in reverent fear. Noah is not building this ark because he's terrified that God's going to drown him if he doesn't do it. He, in other words, he's not living in dread of what will happen if he disobeys. That doesn't really fit the context. Noah is obeying God because of his love for God and a sweet, satisfying reverence or respect or that healthy fear of God. Now, remember what Jesus said in John 14. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, there's something about us. Almost every time we hear that, we hear it as if it were a threat. We hear that as if God is saying, Jesus says, well, if you love me, you'll show me and do a little bit for me. But that's not really what Jesus is saying. Jesus is just telling us that if you have received his love, then naturally you'll love him in return. And if you love him in return, you will want to do what he says to do. Have you ever been in love? People in love... It's amazing how they do things. If you've ever been in love with someone and you're kind of, you know, just gaga over someone and they say to you, do you want to take a walk? You go, sure, sure, let's go for a walk. Where are we going? Who cares where we're going? I want to, I want to be with you. Or if you're in love and your beloved says, 
Can you give me a hand? Sure, sure. I'll do anything for you. Because it's the love that brings about a kind of obedience, you know. That's how the Christian life works. That's why Noah built the ark. He was devoted to the Lord who had first loved him and chose him and made a, an agreement with him. That agreement is called a covenant where God says, in effect, I am yours and you are mine. And it's out of that love that we find this remarkable obedience of faith. Now, I want you to note something here. Faith involves entrusting oneself to God, which leads to obeying God, which in turn results in a witness. And you see that very much in Noah's life. Verse 7 says, by this he condemned the world, or he pronounced a guilty verdict on the world. No, okay, he says by this. Okay, well, what does this, this refer to? Well, this refers to Noah's faith as displayed in his building the ark. Well, how did faithfully building the ark show the rest of the world that they were under some kind of a guilty verdict from God? Well, Noah's boat building was a 120-year sermon. That's a long sermon. It was a 120-year proclamation that God was going to send judgment and destruction upon the earth. But it was also a 120-year proclamation of the good news that deliverance was available for anyone who would have faith and would get into the ark to escape the flood. I mean, do you ever wonder why people get upset by the gospel? I mean, you tell someone, believe in Jesus and you have eternal life and you're going to be with God forever. How awful is that, right? But people sometimes get offended by the gospel. Uh, and, and think about it. If I tell you that you can be saved in Christ, what I'm also saying is that you're guilty before God and you need saving, right? If I tell you you can be saved... You must need to be saved. If, if I tell you that Jesus died for your sins, then you must be a sinner. And not everybody wants to hear that. What people often would rather hear is that they have done such a, a remarkable job of living life and are so awesome. That's what people want to hear. See, Noah invested 120 years as a witness to the truth. He believed in a lot of things that there was no physical evidence for yet. I mean, you, I mean, every day it, didn't, it did not ever look like a flood was coming until the very end, but he believed the word of God. And he was going to take a boat ride into a new world. You know, the Bible talks about the world before the flood and our present world after the flood as being very different, almost like this is a new world. And so Noah was going somewhere where nobody had ever been before, and there was no book to learn about it. There was no pictures. He was doing it completely on faith. And through many, I'm going to say a lot of boring days, uh, through a lot of hard days, through a lot of happy days, there were fun days, there were yucky days, he kept entrusting himself to the invisible, sovereign God. And at times he was misunderstood. Nobody... They thought he was crazy, and they, he was laughed at. He was mocked. Sometimes his words were twisted, but through it all, by faith, he patiently endured, and just for 120 years, he just kept, every day, kept putting one foot in front of another. And see, this is what the readers of Hebrews needed to hear as they endured persecution, and it's what we need to hear today. We entrust ourselves to a risen Savior who nobody can see. If someone's looking for, you know, I mean, you don't look up in the sky and see Jesus up there. We're believing the Word of God. We're waiting for Jesus to return and then to place us in a new world where righteousness dwells and which remains totally unseen to us, and we've never been there before. We live through, well, what's life like for us? We live sometimes through boring days, sometimes hard days. There are fun days. There are good days. There are bad days. There's days we go to a wedding. Another day we go to a funeral. All kinds of days. And we're sometimes misunderstood, sometimes laughed at. Our beliefs are 
sometimes twisted by our culture. But through it all, by faith in Jesus Christ, we patiently keep on putting one foot in front of another. Now, this verse we are looking at today, it saves the very best for last. If you, at the very end of verse 7 says, Noah became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. In other words, he inherited his righteousness that made him acceptable to God, that made him approved from God himself. It was an alien, as Martin Luther would say. It was an outside righteousness that was received through faith alone. Noah did not, Noah could not earn a righteous status on the basis of his own ark building ability or any other acts of obedience. He was a sinner. Later on, we're going to see after the flood, Noah's going to get drunk. I mean, Noah is far from a perfect man. He was a sinner, and he knew he was a sinner. And by faith, he received God's favor. He did receive, by faith, the outside, objective righteousness that the Apostle Paul talks about so fondly. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talks about what he values the most. Now, think about who Paul was before he was the Apostle Paul. He was Saul of Tarsus. And he was one of the most religious, one of the most dedicated, pharisaical Jewish rabbis you ever met. You know, the, the Old Testament had been codified into 613 do's and don'ts. And you can be pretty sure the Apostle Paul, before, well, when he was still Saul of Tarsus, he tried to keep every single one of those 613 do's and don'ts. And he kept a lot of other rules according to oral tradition that had been added on to that. I mean, nobody, if anybody could have earned his way into God's favor, it could have been, it would have been Saul. But what, is, what does he say? He says, my goal is to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. You know, it, keeps by, it comes from my law keeping, but by that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God himself that depends on faith alone. Paul says, I was the most accomplished do-gooder that you'll ever meet, but I'm chucking the whole thing because the only thing that matters is the righteousness of God that is conferred on someone through faith in Jesus. I want to show you something. If you could, if you could open your Bible to Psalm 111 and Psalm 112. These are two psalms that are they're, they're remarkably parallel, and they were intended to be read together in worship. And so the Jews often would, would read these out loud together at the same time. Now, what you're going to see here is Psalm 111 describes the Lord's character, describes what his righteousness is like. Psalm 112 describes the person who fears the Lord and depends on him for his grace and mercy. So Psalm 111 is about God. Psalm 112 is about the character of the believer. But we're going to see how they're, they're parallel. For example, if you look at the end of verse 3 in Psalm 111, describing God, it says, God's righteousness endures forever. Now you look over at the end of verse 3 in Psalm 112, it says of the believer, his righteousness endures forever. It says the exact same thing. The end of verse 4 in Psalm 111, the Lord is gracious and merciful. And then the end of verse 4 in Psalm 112 says the believer is gracious and merciful and righteous. Now, I want you to notice God's incredible grace right here. What, let me tell you what this means. The way God is described in Psalm 111 is the way the righteous man or woman is described in Psalm 112. See, the Bible, what ha what's happening here in these two Psalms is the Bible transfers or it transposes the expressions that describe God's character onto the person who has faith in the Lord, or what we would say today is the person who has faith in Jesus Christ. In addition to that, I want you to notice uh, in Psalm 112, the end of verse 9, speaking of a believer, it says, his righteousness endures forever, and then here it comes, his horn is exalted in honor. 
Now, the horn thing doesn't mean very much today, not to us today. I mean, see, if I say to you, I'm going to lift up your horn, what do you say? Thank you. I mean, but, but it would have meant a lot to the original Hebrew readers of this. They understood perfectly. See, the word horn refers to the horn of a wild ox, and it symbolized military strength and power and glory. So if you lifted up someone's horn, it, it signified they were victorious, that, that they were receiving honor and glory. Now, note the verb tense here. The believer's horn is exalted. It's a passive verb form. It's not something the person... They don't exalt themselves through their own efforts, but God is the one who lifts up the believer's honor, their dignity. God acts on our behalf to provide us with his own honor and character and dignity. That's the gospel. So here's the message. Those who put their faith in God's mercy receive the glory and the dignity that they do not deserve and the honor they could not earn. They are granted the glory of God's own holiness and righteousness. Therefore, if you have faith in Christ, you have received the honor and the dignity of God himself. See, that's a God kind of righteousness. That's better than anything you could ever attain on your own. So I want to take a moment here and talk about a problem I have. And this is something I struggle with at times, and I bet some of you do too. It's what I've been teaching you, it sounds really great, but sometimes I read verses in the Bible that seem to contradict what I'm saying. And then I start to worry. For example, in the, the next to last chapter of the Bible, in Revelation 21, we read the one who conquers will have this heritage, you know, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and earth, and I will be as God and he will be my son. But, it says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And then I think, but sometimes I've acted like a coward. I know I've been cowardly at times. Sometimes my faith isn't very strong. I always have idols in my heart that are distracting me from the Lord, and I've told lies before. So, man, according to one of that verse I just read, I mean, am I headed to the lake of fire? And the gospel tells me, no, no, I'm not. And well, why not? Because I've been a coward. I've told lies. How, what's how, what's going to save me? Even though I have done those things and I have been those things, that is no longer who I am in Christ. God does not remember my sins. He has, ex he has exalted my horn in honor. And therefore, I am, in God's eyes, I am no longer a coward. I'm no longer faithless. I'm no longer a murderer or an idolater or a liar. See, everybody who is in that new heavenly Jerusalem in the, the age to come will have been redeemed in Christ and is no longer any of those bad things. See, God, just as God spoke to humanity back in the days of Noah, so he speaks us to, to us today through the Lord Jesus. Listen to these words from Matthew chapter 24. This is Jesus speaking. He says, For as were the days of Noah so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus is coming back. He has not forgotten you. You, do you remember a singing group called the Kingston Trio? They go way back. They go, I mean, and they, they sang a song in 1959 called the Mary Minuet. It was actually written in 1955 before I was even born. Now listen to the lyrics. They're rioting in Africa. They're starving in Spain. There's hurricanes in Florida, and Texas needs rain. 
The whole world is festering with unhappy souls. The French hate the Germans. The Germans hate the Poles. Italians hate Yugoslavs. South Africans hate the Dutch. And I don't like anybody very much. But we can be tranquil and thankful and proud for man's been endowed with a mushroom-shaped cloud. And we know for certain that some lovely day, someone will set the spark off and we'll all be blown away. They're rioting in Africa. There's strife in Iran. What nature doesn't do to us will be done by our fellow man. I'm thinking that the world has not changed very much since 1955. I mean, it sounds very similar. And, and I mean, the world can be a very dark place. And maybe you feel like you're living in a dark place right now. Maybe it's what's going on around us that bothers you, or maybe some, some personal things in your life. Maybe life isn't going very smoothly for you right now. You can be sure of God's promises to you in Christ, even though what we hope for is still physically unseen to us. And through faith in Christ, God has exalted your horn, your dignity. And in fact, all the character of God is now imputed or credited to you through your faith in Jesus Christ. And he has conferred upon you Christ's own righteousness and holiness. And that fact is guaranteed to rescue you from God's coming judgment. So keep on living by faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for making us heirs of your righteousness. And Father, you didn't just tell us to try harder, but you gave us your own character that you've just granted to us, put in our bank account. And so now we're heirs of everything that's yours, all through faith in Jesus. I pray, Father, that every person, every man and woman and boy and girl here would have this faith in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that, that Rob is here. Rob Ward is here today. And keep working through him and Meredith and the family. Uh, we, we pray. We thank you, full Father, for the service we had yesterday, for the life of Dan Hershey, who, who was really willing to lay down his life uh, in, in, in Africa and for the preaching of the gospel and for all the people he's taught over the years. Thank you for, for his life and the kindness he showed, for the, for the pastors he trained. Father, we are thankful that Esther Ziegler is either home now or about to come home from rehab. Uh, make her all well, Father, heal her. Pastor Mark Sentel is making slow but definite progress after his accident. Please heal him. We thank you that on the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean, there's a very high percentage of Christians, and we pray you would help the church get reestablished after there were so many disruptions with the volcanic eruptions in the late 1990s, Father. Strengthen your people there. We pray for those who attend Alcoholics Anonymous, that they would be able to be free of the chemicals, free of addictions, and you would also draw them to your son. Uh, Father, we, we pray for the Tomans and their, their daughter who's now in Australia to get help for her uh, kidney stones. We pray for Larry and Scott and Sharon and Linda uh, we pray, and for Bill. We pray for healing. Um, keep on healing Meredith. Uh, we pray for our consistory meeting. We make wise choices. We pray for our men's breakfast this coming Saturday morning that you would use it to strengthen our marriages. And to have, Father, keep giving us every day more and more confidence in your grace and your mercy that is abundantly ours in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Praise God for the glorious message of the gospel. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to enter into communion together. Uh, this song is to help us prepare our hearts and minds. One of the ways that we become more like Christ if we are in Christ is that we confess our sins and we trust that God has taken them away because Christ has covered them. So let us stand and sing together, Lord have mercy.
We are going to together right now, we are going to recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, 
Do this in remembrance of me. And Father, we proclaim with great joy this morning the mystery of faith that Christ has died and Christ is risen and Christ will come again. And Father, we, we pray that you would set apart the, the, the bread and the cup uh, that they would be to us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, set us apart also that we would receive this ordinance, the proper frame of mind, and, and know that we've been made one body with Jesus and that he dwells in us and we dwell in him. And Father, we look forward to that coming time when all things are going to be rearranged, all things will be put in subjection under Jesus, and you'll bring all of us, all believers of all time, into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, and we're going to see Jesus face to face. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And now, Father, as Jesus taught us to pray, we will pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Heavenly Father, we don't come into your presence like we trusting in our own righteousness, but we trust in your magnificent grace. And that somehow by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and by his perfect life live for us, all of your characteristics, Father, are somehow credited to us. So we stand before you, before your throne, blameless, and we're now considered worthy and holy. And Father, thank you that we are invited to partake of Jesus Christ himself. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay. take the Lord's Supper together, this is not Pastor Pete 
offering you uh, some locally purchased, you know, bread and grape juice. But by means of the Holy Spirit, it's actually Jesus Christ himself giving you his body and blood. So let us take and eat and remember that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart through faith. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, our older brother, our advocate, our high priest. And thank you for assuring us that we're living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And thank you, Father, for serving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's all stand for the benediction. And now may the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.